Continuing our reading in Yellow Eyes by Rutherford Montgomery, Chapter 10, The Golden One. New snow fell again and stopped the easy hunting. However, Yellow Eyes had learned much about stalking deer by that time. He managed to secure food regularly and never suffered. If he failed to kill and became hungry, he visited one of his former kills and ate the frozen meat left by the foxes and the wolves. Treon saw him often, sliding like a golden shadow through the naked aspen, or poised at the edge of a clearing at dusk. The native hunter could have killed the young cougar whenever he chose to do so, but he never desired the pelt, though he had been promised $500 if he brought it in. Cougar George trailed up the mountain many times in search of the cat, but never saw him. Yellow Eyes knew his enemy and always spotted the hun hunter as he toiled laboriously up through the deep snow. He always slipped away and kept to cover until he saw the back black form toiling back down the mountain. Then spring came, first to the lower valleys, the grasslands in the foothills, then to the scrub oak belt, and last to the aspen and spruce. Yellow Eyes stood one evening in the early dusk and sniffing, sniffed the air of the high country. A chill wind was blowing off the snow caps above, but it was tempered with the promise of new life, a pulsing tinge of warmth, which foretold released streams and muddy fresh beds, the resurrection of spring. The feeling was strong within yellow eyes as he stood there looking down into the hazy valley. An urge was upon him which he could not understand. Restlessly, he padded down the ridge. He had set out to make a kill, but he was not so interested as he should have been. Crusted snow still locked the upper slopes in icy armor. It carried his weight easily, and he trotted along rapidly. He headed downward as though drawn by the pungent smells which floated up to him, carrying a message of stirring life at the grass roots. On a ridge overlooking Treon's cabin, he smelled deer. He flattened himself upon his belly and edged forward until he could look through a clump of rosebriar toward an open meadow. Brown grass stretched between white banks of crusted snow. A young buck was feeding on the dry grass close to a growth of adders. Yellow eyes backed away and circled on noiseless pads until the elders were between himself and the buck. Sliding on his belly, he edged along beside the brushy growth. When he was near enough to halt and look over the rose briar and the buck brush, he raised his head. The buck was feeding a steady chomping of his teeth. Every few minutes, he would lift his head and pause to test the air and to listen. Yellow eyes sank back the black tip of his tail twitching. Slowly he edged forward until he felt he was ready for his first leap. Rising, he surveyed the ground between himself and the buck. He picked the spot where his first leap would land, his padded feet. From that leap, he would hurl down upon the young buck. He settled back and gathered himself together eagerly. <clears throat> As he was about to release his tensed muscles, he heard a scream on his right and saw a tawny body hurl through the air, arching clear of the brush. Snarling with rage, Yellow Eyes sprang into the meadow. He arrived in time to see a slender cougar bring the young buck to earth. Rage filled him. Another hunter had stolen his venison. He bounded out, prepared to give battle. The stranger heard him coming and leaped from the neck of the buck, where the red blood was spurting, to face him from the back of the carcass. The stranger was a young she-cat, her back arched, and she spat angrily, ready to defend her kill. Yellow Eyes advanced to within a few steps of the carcass and stopped. He stared at the sleek lady atop the buck carcass. She was lithe and golden brown in color, with a soft cream tinge to the fur under her flanks and along her belly. She reminded the young king cat of his mother. He forgot. He had come to attack and answered her snarls with a low and throaty growl, which ended in a purr. The golden one on the carcass sat down and looked at him. 
She too felt strangely moved by the meeting. Then, as though ordered to do so, she leaped lightly down from the carcass and stepped to his side. She rose and they rubbed their heads together, purring and snarling softly. After that, they turned their attention to the buck and feasted side by side. In that hour was sealed a union of the wild, a compact foreshadowing a new page in the lives of two young cougars. Treon saw them playing together at the edge of the meadow the next night, and his ready smile flashed as he watched them roll and tumble together on the dry grass. Cougar George, the human, would have more troubles before fall. Yellow Eyes led, led his mate to the cave on the ledge. She was well pleased with his home and made no changes in it, aside from pulling a mountain's rat nest out of a crevice and patting it down in a corner back from the entrance. She did not sleep upon the bed she had made, but lay beside Yellow Eyes close to the entrance. For the next two months, Yellow Eyes and the Golden One ran together at all times. They hunted side by side and slept together in the cave or in an inaccessible thicket They, if they were beyond reach of their home. Yellow Eyes led his mate into the high, inaccessible country above the territory patrolled by Cougar George and his pack of hounds. Some innate sense of fear made him do this. He wanted to protect the Golden One and was afraid if the hounds took to her trail, they might kill her as they had killed his brothers. The Golden One was willing to be led. She was proud of the power and swift strength of her mate. Both were young and their mating had been later than is the usual custom among cougars. Toward the middle of June, the Golden One began to become restless. She dug out another mountain rat's nest and added it to the bed in the corner of the cave. One morning she refused to hunt with yellow eyes and he let her stay in the cave bringing back a snowshoe rabbit for her dinner when he returned. Lying with his head on his paws, he watched her eat it, and his purr was louder than hers. After her meal, they rolled on the rocky floor playfully. Then the golden one lay down and slept. She slept a great deal from then on, and yellow eyes brought many meals to her. One day, she shouldered him from the cave, and her low growl bade him to be off. After that, he stayed away, though he ranged and hunted near the ledge for several days. Finally, he returned, and the Golden One met him proudly at the entrance to the cave. He greeted her and stalked inside. On the pallet of rats' nests lay four squirming kittens, spotted champs with tightly sealed eyes and yawning pink mouths. Yellow eyes crossed to the squirming babies and began licking them, while the Golden One rubbed her head against his shoulder. Anyone seeing them would have realized at once the fallacy of the ancient belief that the Tom of the Cat tribe always destroys his young if he finds them. The Golden One leaped back and stood at the entrance to the cave. With a low cry, she leaped out on the ledge and flashed from sight. Yellow Eyes lay down and played with his babies. His mate ranged through the coming twilight until she had made a kill. She ate hungrily, and when she had finished, she loped back to the ledge and entered the cave. After that, Yellow Eyes did most of the hunting. At times, the Golden One went with him, and they left the babies curled up in a ball on the rats' nests. Those were happy, busy days for both parents. Three days after the return of Yellow Eyes, the babies opened their eyes and began to move about on shaking legs. They were covered with fine yellow-brown hair, elaborately spotted with black. Their little eyes blinked at the light from the entrance. They were healthy little fellows and always ready to nurse at their mother's breast. The summer came with soft nights and warm days. Yellow Eyes began to forget about Cougar George and his dogs. But Cougar George had not forgotten his promise. He knew the young killer was ranging high and would not be down until later. He had many other things to look after, such as poisoning coyotes, and setting traps for the big lobo wolf who was harassing the calf pastures in the lower ranges. Had he suspected the family's existence, he would have packed his camp and moved to the high country at once. As it was, he delayed this trip until midsummer, giving Yellow Eyes and the Golden One a chance to live unmolested. And that's the end of chapter 10.